rah, 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 rah. That's, that Selwyn should just have some guy behind him going, rah, 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 blah, 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 blah. But his wife is off to the book club. Hey, Maniacs. Hey, Maniacs. Welcome to Midsummer Maniacs. Episode 20. 20. Two zero. I feel like I could buy beer soon. <laughs> One more episode. Yep. Today we're talking about Market for Murder, Season 5, Episode 2. And just as an intro to the show, Midsummer Maniacs is a podcast dedicated to ITV series Midsummer Murders. Each week we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else that we love. And if you're listening with kids, if they're able to handle the craziness, the debauchery that is Midsummer Murders, they can probably handle the podcast. Exactly. <laughs> this episode was filmed in September, October uh, 2001, and the broadcast date was the 16th of June 2002. It had 8.99 million viewers uh, on its first uh, showing and is directed by Sarah Hellings, which I think is our second female director, and written by Andrew Payne. Before we start, though, Mark, I have to tell you something. Okay. Lay it on me. Pretty serious. Okay. Remember about 10 years ago, we saw Jon Stewart at the IU Auditorium? Yeah, I don't think it was 10 years ago, but yeah, we did. He looked at me. Okay. And I could tell. And what did John say to you? He wanted me to wait 10 years and then kill some people to go be with him. Okay. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand why Sandra does either. The killer in this episode, that's exactly what she does. Yeah, she does. She waits 10 years. Yeah. For someone who did not express interest in her. Yes. To somehow subliminally, imaginarily give her killing orders. Well, you see, she has this particular thing called I'm a loony. <laughs> oh, is that a clinical thing? It's clinical I'm a loony. Loony craziest. And on, on second watching of this, all the goofy things that the Lord does that are sound like stupid old man flirting now have this horrible creepiness to them. Yeah, when you know how she's interpreting them. Yeah, she's taking him literally all the time. Yeah, and we're not ruining anything for you. We assume that you've watched this episode at least once, maybe recently. If you follow us on the Twitter or the Instagram, you will have got a little reminder that you should watch Market for Murder. So you already know how Looney Tunes Sandra is. Absolutely crazy ass. So let's get started. So our cold opening, Selwyn. <sighs> <laughs> Concentrate on the car. <laughs> yeah. It's a beautiful car. It's a 1963 Alvis, which is worth about 40K. Wow. It's a nice car. Yeah. It's an old car. Um, somebody puts petrol on a rag and stuffs it in the wheel well mm -hmm. and then lights it, knowing that he is going to get in it soon. How does that person know? Because they know that he's sleeping with Jenny Sharp. I guess. I don't like it. I, like, how long did she wait outside the house? Or maybe she didn't intend for him to get in the car at all. She just intended to destroy the car. I think it's completely by accident that Selwyn gets in the car. Yeah. Initially, you think he gets in the car and he sees the flames and he has trouble with his seatbelt. And you think, oh, no, they've jimmied his seatbelt. He's not going to be able to get out. He's he definitely going to die. to die. And I think he's just panicking. I think so. Uh, for a man who seems to think so much of himself, he sure panics pretty quickly. I'm impressed that a 1963 car has shoulder belts. I'm impressed it has seat belts. I think they're aftermarket. <laughs> now, I had a 1965 Plymouth Fury 2, and it had lap belts. Okay. But there were no shoulder belts. No. It was just like strapping in in a roller coaster. <laughs> That had nothing to do with my driving. A couple of things about this car explosion. Mm. I think this is the first real staged explosion for Midsummer. Yeah, and it's a big one. The car definitely 
It goes up. They destroy a $40,000 car. Now, it may not have been in the best shape because if you notice, it doesn't move anywhere. No, it may just be a shell of a car. But they have at least four cameras on this shot, which is impressive. Yeah. They did They did quite a, like... There's some slow-mo, too, isn't there? The there <laughs> there's some slow-mo and four shots, four camera shots, and clearly not Selwyn running away <laughs> from the car. I have to tell you, though, in my long history of looking at dubious websites and research for this show, I... Looked pretty thoroughly about how to light a car on fire from the outside. Yes. <laughs> and um, uh, what they did would not work. I don't think so. It like, wouldn't even melt the tire. No. It would have to get up to 400 degrees and to melt the tire. And probably what would have happened is the rag would have burned. It would have heated the tire, which might have popped it. Yeah. And then it would have basically put itself out if you really want to burn a car you got to light it from the inside that's where all the flammable stuff is or stuff something down the gas tank thing bust a window throw a molotov cocktail inside there you go sandra a flaming rag in a in the gas tank will not burn a car there's not enough oxygen in there that's true that's true it will burn itself out so some tips for sandra (laughs) first well hey it worked for her Ten years is a long time to wait for somebody. Yeah. Second of who all. Who has no intention on you anyway. If you're going to blow up a car, you need to bust a window and put a Molotov cocktail in there. Or just open the door. But leaving, the, you'd have to leave the door open. It needs oxygen. I've researched this too much. Speaking I'm on of, a list now, I'm sure. Speaking of the windows of the car, speaking of <laughs> Midsummer Maniac stuff, the window is closed. Selwyn gets in the car. The window is closed. Mm -hmm. The fire goes off and Selwyn struggles with the seatbelt. Right. Suddenly, the window is half open. Oh. I think what happened was there, it was hot and there were fumes and the actor rolled down the window to be more comfortable. Yeah. In between shots or something. Yeah. Do you think that the fire that's behind him in that shot is anywhere near the car? Uh, that's a controlled fire and nowhere near the car. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Like it's it looks to be about s- ten feet away. Yeah. Feet away. Right. Because he's like that's talent. You gotta be nice to the talent. You They're can't like just, insured and everything. Yeah, you can't like put them in danger or anything like that. The actor who plays Salwyn Proctor is Rupert Vansitart. He is quite the name, doesn't he? <laughs> Vansitart. I would like one Vansitart. With whipped cream, please. Yes. Um, this is his first of three Midsummers. Oh, really? I didn't know he was in three. He's also in The Axe Man Cometh. Nice. In which he plays an, an uppity, angry snob. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And in The Dogleg Murders, in which he plays an uppity, angry snob. Interesting. And he's in Game of Thrones, too. What he, does he play in that? Lord John Royce, who is... An uppity, angry snob. <laughs> this man has been typecast. But there's evidence that he himself, Vandis Start, God, Vanis, Vansitart. Vansitart. It's really hard to I say. would like one of Vansitart to please. <laughs> that he himself is, is not an uppity, snobby jerk. Well, that's good, because he gets lots of work, so he must be easy to work with. Yeah, and he um, he's in a, a, a big... Um, Stage revival of Arsenic and Old Lace. Oh, what part does he play in that? Do you want to guess? Uh, does he play the teddy part? Yes, he does. Oh, he must just eat up the scenery. Off to Panama. Off to Panama. It's a very Teddy Roosevelt look. Yep. He's got the mustache and the um, pith helmet and everything. Oh, I'm sure he has all sorts of fun. He plays such a scumbag so well that I'm sure he's genuine and nice and warm the rest of the time yeah because he is certainly a scumbag here his wife tams in the next morning right so they i don't quite understand what happens here so the car is on fire it's evening yes pre-bedtime yes though he's gone around and turned off all the lights on tamsin there is an explosion yes which i don't i don't know if we know exactly what time it is but let's say it's nine o'clock well he's still going out for a booty call yeah, but it's late. Yeah. Right? But the cops don't come until the morning? Well, you know, it's just an explosion. <laughs> well, I would think that the fire department came in the meantime and put the car out. But I would the think cops the, are like, we'll wait till light. I think emergency service would call everybody. Yeah, but I can understand why the detectives wouldn't be called out until the morning, because what is there to look at at night, right? Well, I don't know, because Troy has other things on his mind. Oh, sorry. 
another thing on his mind. <laughs> so Selwyn's wife, Tamsin, is there. She is played by Carolyn Harker. Mm -hmm. And an interesting thing about her is that she's married to Anthony Caff, who plays Stephen Cavendish in Dead Man's Eleven. Oh, she's married to Stephen. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> so they're, they're a midsummer couple in real life. Selwyn is so bad about arranging things. He says, it's me. We're on. Usual place. Yeah, like that. that is some dangerous sexy talk right there. And he's calling Jenny Sharp. Yep. Right? Who is this independently wealthy, foxy lady, very smart. Yeah. Why the hell would she sit around her house hoping that he would call? Well, maybe there's not enough ashtrays in, in the pool that night. <laughs> you mean in the pool that she owns by the huge house that she owns? Yeah. I don't understand their relationship because it's like six different things all at once. And in everything he is, he's an asshole. 100% asshole. I think she could do better. Absolutely, she could do better. <laughs> so after I noted the Alvis, I kind of had cars on my mind. So I noticed that when we first see Tom and Troy, when they're driving up to the scene of the uh, inflagration. Yes. Conflagration. Conflagration. They're driving a Rover 45. Which is a nice car. You'd think so. Oh. See, that's what caught my eye. Mm. Was I thought, oh, it's got that cool little crest on it. It does. What are they driving? It may be a nice car. It's kind of a cool car. Yeah. No, it's a, a flop. Oh. It's a sedan put out by Land Rover that is now like even a um, 2004. You can't sell them for a grand. A grand? Yeah. It, was there something wrong with the car? They, they were just jalopies, apparently. Oh, well. If you go to Google it and you put in Rover 45... Like the first three predictions that Google will make are problems, lemon, flop, or wreck, or something like that. Like they're just really bad cars, apparently. Apparently. <laughs> I had no idea. Harry the Painter the Pool Man doesn't have one, though. No. So Harry uh, Painter, is that a name or a description? No, because he's a pool man. I know. He's it's Harry the Pool great, Man. A, a joke that I have. He's Harry the Pool Man, and Barnaby doesn't like him right away. I think he recognizes him. I don't think so. You don't? Maybe he's just got a little, maybe he's got a the look of a convict. He gets Barnaby's radar, that's for sure. Yeah, because, of course, Troy's gone into the newsagent that he's desperate to get into. I'm going to tell you something about this episode, okay? I took the most amount of notes for this episode <laughs> than any episode before, and the reason is, you all know I'm completely obsessed with printed material in this show, mm -hmm. and there is a lot of printed material, especially in the beginning of this show, so bear with me. And some worth looking at, to be fair to you. There is absolutely some very interesting things there. <laughs> It's not just you looking at st stupid stuff in my new type. <laughs> Troy goes into the news agents and comes out with a financial paper, the Investment Daily. It's orange. This paper does not exist. No. Okay. Also, this paper has some trouble. <laughs> it is 25 years of investment advice. So it's 25 years in publication, right? Okay. Okay. You would think that after 25 years of publication, they would get the date right. Because the 5th of September, 2001, which is what's listed on the front cover, is not a Thursday. It's a Wednesday. <gasps> In addition, the Hawk comes out on Monday, as we'll learn. So what was Troy doing until Thursday, which is actually a Wednesday? <laughs> hmm. Wait a minute. It comes out on Monday. Yes. And it could either be Wednesday or Thursday. Yes. When the episode starts. Yes. So he's buying it two days late. Late. Which is why he's in a panic, because he's afraid oh, they won't have it. Maybe. There you go. Uh, there's a website, Earl, on the front of Investment Daily. Doesn't work. Well, it's a fake newspaper. Of course it doesn't work. I thought somebody might have bought the Earl. Uh, the Dependable Insurance Inquiry is the first thing on the cover, and it's by Chris Penfold, who does not work for Investment Daily. He is a script editor for Midsummer Murders. Aww. Maybe he wrote the paper. He, I think he did and all of the stuff on the paper. He put his name on it. That's fun. I hope uh, he got to keep it. Other headlines include Halcyon Days Return Heralded by Comms Results. Okay. Learner Survivor Fit for Future Gains. And more rate cuts looming. 
Okay. <laughs> Clearly written by somebody else who doesn't understand finance. Exactly. Money things go up. Money things go up. Big day for money stuff. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Stock things or something. So they talk to Selwyn. He says, I turned on the key and it just went on fire. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. That's that Selwyn should just have some guy behind him going. But his wife is off to the book club. Well, and she says, oh, how how sorry for James. And he's like, what do you mean? It's blah, 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 James is my, my car. car. Because he bought it from James Chetwood, who, of course, had let it go to rack and ruin. And he, Selman, had invested a lot of money to get it restored. The Chetwood estate is a bloody disaster. <laughs> Tamsin is reading Tuscan Spring by Sebastian Woods. This is fakety fake book of mm-hmm. fake town. Okay. I think it's a reference to Under the Tuscan Sun, which was released at about the same time. I would agree, obviously. But it's a a great big old book. It's it's a big old book, and we'll talk about who read it later on. And these women are not smart about this, okay? Nope. They've had this book club for four years, and they've had the same book for four years. That's dumb. Yeah. Really, I couldn't talk about any book for four years. If they really wanted to hide what they were doing, they would have got a new book every once in a while. I couldn't talk about the same television show for four years. (laughs) Well, it's not going to be quite four years. Okay. (laughs) We go to the Chetwood estate, and it is. It's a big old pile of crap. Well, that's what those estates are like, right? They probably are broke because of estate tax. Yep. He inherited it, right? And James has taken his pulse because he's the biggest hypochondriac we've seen yet. Surrounded by dripping buckets, even though it's not raining outside. He's off to see Doc Bradshaw. Doc Bradshaw and his wife, Sandra. His name's Rupert. That's the only thing I don't like about Doc Bradshaw. He's a good guy. He's a very good guy. It's also where we get to meet Vera Hopkins. Yes. Played by Dillis Lay. She's in charge of salads. Lots to think about there. Yes. <laughs> she was in four Carry On movies. Well, that's fantastic. Dillis Lay was. She's best known for being a comedic actress. I would, she's very funny. I would assume so, being in Carry On movies. <laughs> she's very but, funny. So Sandra's off to the book club also. So now we know that Tamison, Lady Lavinia, Lavinia, who is Lady Chetwood, and Sandra are all in the book club. Mm-hmm. And she's upset because she hasn't received an invitation to Marjorie's garden party. Speaking of Lavinia, yep. Speaking of people married to people who have been in Midsummer's, Lady Lavinia. Lavinia is such a great name. It's a fantastic name. Um, the actress's name is Angela Thorne. Okay, that's a pretty good name too. She's been in a million things, of course. Yeah. But she's married, she was married before he died, to Peter Penry Jones, who played Peter in The Electric Vendetta. Hmm. Who's Peter in The Electric Vendetta? He's the the brewery, the whiskey distillery oh, owner who comes back who shows up for the duel. The yeah. Who lost the duel at the very beginning. That's nice. They're married to one another. Yeah. The doctor says there's no invitation and all it is is warm pims and rubbery quiche. (laughs) Pims is a uh, basically the cheapest wine spritzery alcohol you can get. Yeah. Not a mocktail, but it's like a cheap cocktail pre-mixed, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not about fun. You have no social or professional drive. It's about our status in society, village okay. society. Wait a minute, Looney Tunes. He has a practice. The office is busy. He provides you a house that you set and arrange things in. <laughs> How is he not professionally successful? Well, her glasses are shaped like stop signs. Oh, stop. <laughs> I'm a Looney Tunes. <laughs> But Dr. Rupert is so nice. He is. Ginny Sharp is... Mysteriously independently wealthy and receives a robe in the mail. She also doesn't believe in, uh, what are they called? The top three buttons of her blouse. (laughs) Ever. Ever. (laughs) That was a look then, though. And that, um, every time I see a woman in the, like, early 90s, late 80s with that short hair, I just think that's a Lady Di thing. I don't know. After Diana, a lot of women cut their hair short and kept it short like that for a while. I literally stopped paying attention to her and was like, don't let your boobs fall out. And then I was like... Stop looking at her boobs fall out. And then I just felt pervy. <laughs> she doesn't really have much boobs to uh, speak of. But. Uh, 
I just got worried about it. And we finally get to meet Marjorie. Well, hold on, because there's paper in Ginny Sharp's house. Oh, great paper. Ginny Sharp's address is The Lodge, Midsummer Market, I think. Mm-hmm. Costin. That's all that's on the envelope. <laughs> well, she must be pretty well known. I guess so. I had some brown paper with no return address. She's all upset about the pe- the package. She should be. Then off to Marjorie's, who's waiting outside for her. I think she's last to arrive, so she's, like, trying to look impatient. Uh, I I just was like, oh, I dislike Marjorie already. Maybe she should fall down some stairs. Oh, well, wait well, a minute. Gerald probably didn't like her either. No, I don't think Gerald liked her either. Dear, dead Gerald. Yes. Marjorie Empson. Yes. Empson. Yes. I want to say Epson every time. Yeah. Marjorie Empson. I did want to say Epson all the time. Played by Barbara Lee Hunt. Yep. She was in Frenzy. Really? She was the psychiatrist that got killed in Frenzy, the oh, Alfred Hitchcock movie. That already had people in it that we, uh, that had. We've made reference to it before. You the, want to talk about corpse acting. Yeah. This woman did the best corpse acting in a Hitchcock movie right there. I forget what her. Dead body acting in a car. Oh, her tongue's out. Yeah. She's laying in the chair. Oh, that's right. And she's there for a long time. That's There's like right. shot after shot of her body yeah. with her tongue out. <laughs> so she's got a Sony Vile laptop. Man, I looked on about 20 different websites of Sony Vio web top, mm. laptops to find this laptop, and I couldn't find it. It's an oldie. It's an oldie. The- it's a 98 or 99 Sony Vio laptop. And at that point in time, they were the top bomb. of the line. Absolutely top of the line. Absolutely. And she has the Reading Club portfolio summary, which includes the following stocks. And her computer makes that awesome noise. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I have a problem with that noise. <laughs> Computers don't make noises like that. All right. The first stock they own is Offshore Maven Motels. How can a hotel be offshore and be a motel? Mm, I don't know. We'll just have to go with it. Then they have photovoltaic futures. Now, futures is spelled with a PH. <laughs> well, it's photo. Yes. Is that spelled with a PH? Yes. Okay. The Technic Mining Technology Company. Okay. That's okay. And then my favorite, Worldwide Pizza Parlors. <laughs> Well, they've diversified. Hotels, technology, and pizza. Yep. Motels. <laughs> motels. Motel. You could have your motel, have your pizza brought to your offshore Maven motel. What the hell is a Maven motel? While you're working with your photovoltaic stuff. Futures. Futures. P- futures. <laughs> we should stop making fun of Marjorie because my darling Gerald would be upset with that. Absolutely. Man, is she bureaucratic. She is. I don't want to belong to any club. I don't even care how much money they're making where everything is done by Roger's Rules of Order. Robert, <sighs> is it Robert? It's Robert's Rules of Robert's Order. Robert's Rules of Order. She's like, and, well, I don't know. If we want to have cookies instead of these scones, we better take a vote all in favor. Oh, shut up. Yeah, and <laughs> like majority rules is not actually the best thing in You know, sometimes you need consensus. Well, Sandra really should get two votes because she's so good with numbers because her dad was a bookie. Wow. Like, okay, Sandra is Looney Tunes. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. But Marjorie is the person, the kid at the zoo where the rabbit animal is poking it with a stick. (laughs) I know you're crazy and all, but your dad was a bookie. Two of them want to leave and the other one's... Want to stay, right? Everybody leaves except for Tamison, who wants out. Because she wants to cash in to get some money. Yeah. We because, find out later because of her son. Yeah. And Sandra talks to Ginny out in the parking lot. Yes. To say, were you invited to the garden party? No, to say, did your boobs fall out? Are you boobs falling out? <laughs> oh my gosh, another button is done. Okay, I have a plot question. Okay. Stop. We know that they were, in fact, invited to the garden party because we see her husband tear up the invitation at the end of the episode, right? He hid it from her. Okay. That was my question. Yeah. Was, does she just not know at that point that they've been invited? Did it get lost and they got it later? No. Or is he hiding it? I think he hid it. So why is he hiding it? Because he doesn't want to go? It's or because Pims he knows and she's a loony. And I think, I think he doesn't want to go because he hates it. And I think 
he also realizes it will upset her. That it's not good for her. They don't have a good relationship. They but haven't slept it, together in 10 years. Isn't it worse They're not together, her? like single beds, not together. And not in the same room. They're not in the same room. But isn't it worse for her to be obsessed about not being invited? I don't know. It's not explained. Because he seems to care. Well, he kind of works out in the end, and we'll talk about that at the end That's of the episode. That's true. That's true. What we find is that Troy bought the paper to hide something. The hawk. The hawk. The hawk, of course, is not a real comic book. No. But it's a play on the eagle, which we saw earlier in the series, which has Dan Dare in. So the eagle was the magazine that Dan Dare was in. And it's printed in that same large format. Mm -hmm. Right. The following things are on the cover of the eagle. <laughs> of the hawk sorry superhero adventure for boys it's only for boys 18th july 2001 volume 56 number 12 every monday 35p okay 30. wait a minute that's the 18th of july yes but we've already figured out that it's september yeah like this is an old issue there's some problems here. why is he in such a hurry to buy it i don't know <laughs> Maybe they didn't expect viewers to look so closely. <laughs> I know. Well, Crazy. They messed up here. <laughs> they didn't plan on you. Inside, the hawk includes the following. Commando stories, classic sports cars, adventure, excitement, competitions, plus more action. Glad it comes with more action now. The hawk, private eye... The world is held at ransom. The story so far, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, God. The newly appointed government puppet turns out to be the evil doctor. That's all in capital letters. <laughs> Stepping up his missile program, then turning them on the earth to gain world domination. Dot, dot, dot. But can the hawk stop him in time? No question mark. And included is this, is some dialogue. Look out, Hawk! The missiles are headed to Earth! And in big, large type, impact one minute. <laughs> Just because you can read it doesn't mean you have to. It's fascinating. <laughs> to you! <laughs> I have wanted Midsummer props. I have. I have. I've looked online for Midsummer props. I want the Badger's Drift map that's in... The Killings of Badger's Drift. I want all sorts of things. Close I'll, Encounters of the Midsummer Kind. Close Encounters kind. of the Midsummer Kind. This is the holy grail <laughs> that I want. I want the hawk desperately. Well, you can't because Troy's selling them. Yep, he's selling them all. He pets the comic. Oh, when he sees the one on Lord Chetwood's bed? He also he pets, caresses yeah, it. He caresses it there. For sure. The hawk's powers include night vision and he can fly. When he's a hawk. Well, yeah, he's a flying detective. Yep, exactly. We get Joyce talking to Barnaby about dependable insurance. Yeah, whatever. It's complete throwaway scene, right? Except for the story in the newspaper, <laughs> which has a whole bunch of text that I'm going to go over, right? I'm, I'm going to skip over it. The two important things are city, city regulators to investigate pensions. So this is Barnaby's pension plan. Mm -hmm. This is an ongoing backstory thread thing. In the story, it says the head of the pension plan's name is Sir Headley Feline. <laughs> and then it goes on to quote Sir Headley about how secure the pensions are and how secure the company is and how nobody has anything to worry about. And then it says from his headquarters in Belize. <laughs> so Barnaby's Tom pension is, is headquartered in Belize. Yeah, Tom is being taken for a ride here. Tom's in trouble. Killer Cam at Marjorie's. Oh, Cheryl, the world is just full of such mean people. People are so <laughs> wicked. Oops, I'm at the bottom of the stairs. And we hear her falling down the stairs. We don't see her falling down Yeah, you the see stairs. her start to fall. And then you have this weird thing, okay? This is at night, right? Mm -hmm. She's, we know later on that Jenny has come over. They've had a row. Mm -hmm. And then she went upstairs, got changed, and was sad. Right? Yeah. That's what happened. Expecting to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Now, after she falls down the stairs, the next immediate shot is of a computer screen with stocks on it. Mm -hmm. 
with sound of a television playing stock reports mm-hmm. that pans over everything to her bloody body. Mm-hmm. Even, and the blood is fresh. So okay. we're assuming this is happening. It's the same night. Do you usually go to bed with the TV on and your computer going? No. Yeah, it's weird. It's like, we'll put these things in because they're at Marjorie's house. But, but Sanders also crazy. So she may have killed her and then sat down at her computer to sell the stocks and turned on the TV to see what they were selling at. She could have. I got to admit that. But wouldn't she need the internet to do that? She's weird, so. Wouldn't she need the internet to sell the stocks? She should use the internet to sell the stocks. There are a number of actual stock problems with this Would episode. Marjorie have internet? Was there internet yet? Uh, it's 2000, so yeah, people would have internet. But it'd be like... No, no, people were starting to get high-speed internet by then. But not Marjorie. Not, not Marjorie. She's not going on the web. But when I was there in 93, they had intertubes, so... Surfing the cyberspace. Yep. Marjorie. Cyberspace. Virtual Marjorie. At the surgery the next morning, there's a bunch of people who never show up again, and I kind of regret writing them all down. <laughs> well, we get to see Vera again, who in my notes is always Salads Vera. Yes. Lord Chetwood arrives and moves right to the front of the line. Because he's a crazy hypochondriac. And but she loves him. He's titled, so he has to get help right away, even though Rupert's like, why can't he make an appointment like everybody else? Lord Chetwood complains about pressure behind his eyes and that the cops are everywhere and he's lost his Elvis. So Rupert suggests PTSD. And the doctor, Rupert's so awesome. He takes his blood pressure with no stethoscope. Nope. Now, he might be palpating. He might be feeling his pulse yeah. instead of listening to it, which is something you do if you're in a loud place and you need to take somebody's blood pressure. Mm-hmm. But this is not a loud place. I think he's just... Uh, going through the motions. Going through the motions. Yeah. Tamsin's upset because she has a little boy's picture. But the pool man is fishing plastic letters out of the pool. And he gets a vowel. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to solve the puzzle. No, Joyce does that later. (laughs) Because Tom is sitting there looking at the plastic letters. I love that scene. I want to talk to you people in England, okay? Do you all have your doors wide open all the time? (laughs) You going to bleep that? Yeah. Okay. Because sweet Jesus. Well, did you know there are no bugs in England? No bugs at all. So you can leave your doors open and no badgers or mosquitoes or, you know, other kind of crazy animals ever wander into your very expensive house. And then she says this thing really quickly to the pool man. She goes, I want to talk to you about the reading club. And Harry makes a joke. He's like, oh, I'll stay here. And I think she's serious. (laughs) (laughs) Well, she's talked to him about it before. Now, she gets a call from Ginny that... She has to go to Jenny's house. Because Marjorie's dead. Yep. Scene of the crime. George, there's blood on a stick. By the way, Jenny Sharp is played by Serena Gordon. Okay. She was in Goldeneye. Yes, she was. She was indeed. That's about the only interesting thing. I wonder thing. if she did the voice for that character in the video game. I don't know. If she yeah. did, she wouldn't be the only midsummer actor to voice Bond characters in a video game. So, as you could tell, I've completely lost the plot of this episode. So now, in this scene, I'm obsessed with George's clipboard. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. (laughs) Listeners, dear listeners, I'm sorry. It's a magical clipboard because he doesn't have it and then suddenly has it. And I want to know what is on that clipboard because I can't read it. And there's lines and boxes and squares and I want to read every single part of it. It's a fake form that says, is the body dead? Yes or no? (laughs) Was her husband named Gerald? Yes or no? Her house is ransacked. Yep. She was beaten with her own stick. Yep. The dining room is a wreck. Her silver is stolen and the safe is open. Yeah. It looks robbery-ish. Ish. Ish. Yeah. And there's a meeting at Ginny's nice pad. Why do they go to Marjorie's? Why not be at Ginny's? It's a nicer place. Because Marjorie's in charge. I guess so. And she's got that great big laptop. She couldn't possibly carry it to Ginny's. I don't know if there's a car big enough for that laptop. <laughs> Top of the line. So now that Marjorie's dead, they the ladies realize they're going to have to come clean about what the reading club actually did. Yes, and then there's a kind of montage of them telling their husbands. The ones who have them. Lavinia, it, uh, Lord Chetwood's like, hey, we got money now. She's like, no, it's for the roof. Sandra is like, it, Rupert is completely surprised by what Sandra says, and he's like, 
it seemed like a long time to be reading the same book. She was like, no one would ever want to read that book. And he's like, I did. I thought it would give us something to talk about. I, you can hear Rupert's heart breaking, like, <laughs> at that exact moment. Re-breaking, because... Yeah, it's been broken lots of times. Yeah. Well, Selwyn takes this completely intelligently and logically. <laughs> he's calm. Yes. He calls her a thickhead. And screams at her. Is this about babies again? Because I'm done with talking about babies. You imagine him with a baby? You imagine a baby Selwyn? <laughs> that would be the most hideous, horrible baby. It'd be a baby, but with his head. And it would just go, blah, 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 Instead of cooing or crying. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Ginny explains that men suck. Well, yeah. And uh, that she had stayed in last night and uh, had a good book and some wine. <laughs> Thanks. Or maybe she was at a hotel, you know. Maybe. Having sex with Selwyn. No. Who knows? No, no. Well, we know what she is. It comes out later. Back to the manor. And my final digression, I think, in the first part of this. Your first, your last digression in the first part. Yes. (laughs) Okay. Aspirin Towel Roofing Services. Now, there's a phone number on there. They do new roofs, repair, storm damage. And then they, it, at the bottom, it says lead work. You're talking about the truck that's in front of the Chetwoods. Yes, the roofers. Yeah, they do lead work, lead roofs. And then I thought about roofers in England mm-hmm. and how, oh my God, it must be so difficult to be a roofer in England. You've got thatch houses, you've got lead houses, you've got shingles, you've got all sorts of the regular stuff. It, it just must be a nightmare to be a roofer there. Well, the same guy doesn't do all that. The guys who do thatching only do thatching. They don't do asphalt shingles. On the house, it has a lot. On the van, it has a lot of things. Well, they're not doing thatch. I'll tell you that. I've watched enough demolition, reconstruction, fixer-upper guy, British show, that George guy. Those thatchers are serious. Maybe we should give this number a call and ask if they do thatch. (laughs) That's all they do if they do thatch. Troy's not impressed with Lord uh, Chetwood's wallpapering job. Wallpapering job. job. (laughs) To be honest, I'm not impressed with Lord Chetwood's wallpapering job. Or his clothing job. Like, he's practically licking the back of the wallpaper and trying to stick it back on the wall. He's totally, totally water damaged. He totally is like hobo. It's, it's, it's hobo chic. Yep. But How many ascots can you wear? And Troy asks where Lady Chetwood is, and he tells him, and then he realizes that was Lord Chetwood. Don't. Don't. <laughs> He does get that don't face on, too. I know we're maniacs, and I know we're continuity people, but at no point in the series up until this point, we're in episode 20, has Troy ever had fear of heights? And he has been in a few situations where if he was, we would know. Yes. I don't like this. It's like, oh, let's put fear of heights in Troy. It is kind of funny. It is, but... And it gives them a reason to shoot the roof a little bit more. I also think the reason why he's afraid of heights is because it offsets the fact that Lavinia is absolutely comfortable on the roof because she has to be up there so many, so often because it has such problems. I guess. That she's like, what, we're on the roof. There's lots of space up here. What's the big deal? And he's like, oh, I'm so afraid. And she's like, yeah, whatever. We can talk right here. But if somebody told me that, uh, okay, I'm up on the roof, which is strange already. And I'm talking to somebody, and they say I'm afraid to be on the roof. I would go, okay, well, let's move inside. She's got serious reasons to be up there. The roofers are there. Okay. To it's get a quote. Police to get a quote for a Selwyn. They're pricing out the roof for Selwyn. Yeah. Not even for her. Hmm. Selwyn. What does Jenny see in him? I don't understand. Do not understand. What I have written down is, hmm. I'm an independently wealthy, smart, pretty woman. What do I want? I know an overbearing, sexist, rude, heavy-browed, tightwad. Baby man. Swoon. (laughs) (laughs) Back at the Proctors, they go and talk to Tamison, and she almost says something about her husband, but doesn't. Well, she knows she needs to be really careful because he is something in finance. But I don't know, like, if he's a stockbroker, what insider trading is going to happen? Well, assuming that they had a normal relationship, he would come home and go, well, you know, that worldwide pizza is going to get really big soon. And she'd go, hmm, I'll tell the reading club. I guess it's a stretch. What she really does is tell Harry Painter. Yep. And he goes off and makes money. That's not a description. It's a name. (laughs) (laughs) He's not a Harry Painter. 
<laughs> it's not a hairy pant- painter. It's just Harry Painter. At lunch, they discuss the case until they go talk to Harry Painter, <laughs> who was at the pub for the quiz, the by night, the way. The night before. Yeah. Yeah, he was at the quiz. Uh, oh, kno- to have a pub that has a quiz night. Oh. Wouldn't that be nice? It would be. But Harry knows everything about Dependable. He knows that Tom's pension is down the toilet. Yeah, absolutely. So then we go from Lord Chetwood being bumbling old curmudgeon hypochondriac hypochondriac hobo being creepy. There's not much redeemable about him. I know Lavinia loves him, and they seem kind of sweet together, but he talks about her nasty behind her back, and then he goes peeping on Jenny Sharp at her pool. And he spends all her money. I mean, he yeah. just there's not a yeah. whole lot redeemable about him except kind of being a bumbling idiot. Yeah, he's he's no Mr. Toad. No, no. There's nothing redeemable. Selwyn arrives. <sighs> Luckily, they have 23 minutes. Where does like, he need to be? Uh, there's just so much wrong with this. He's so far away from anywhere where stocks are traded, it's not even funny. They appear to be completely in love in this scene. And yet, in every other scene, she talks about him as if he's abusive and she wants to run away from him immediately. Tamsin looks like he's abusive and wants to run away immediately. She looks like she's into his 23-minute party time. Hey, 23 minutes with you, Selwyn? Awesome. Lord Chetwood finds the silver. In a trash bag by Jenny's wall, right? Because somebody's trying to frame her in the dumbest way possible. Because that's what she'd do. Go kill Marjorie, put the silver in a trash bag, and drop it over her wall, where nobody will find it. Ever. What I want to know, though, is if Sandra put the silver there, did she also know that Lord Chetwood spied on Jenny from that spot? Yes, because she listened in to him, because he told her husband. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So he was expected to find it. Yeah. We go to the autopsy, and I don't care what happens in this scene, because the last line creeps me out. I do. Because when we talk about best corpse acting, I don't think that's even Marjorie on the table. It's not Marjorie on the table. It's the only time we ever no. see them cover a corpse's face. Yeah, yeah it's not it's Marjorie. It's like it's an arm yeah. of a woman it's who's just... kind of built like Marjorie. Yeah, it's not Marjorie. She wasn't there that day. The last line of the scene is coffee. And I'm immediately freaked out because I'm like, do they have food in the morgue? Because, ew. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can have coffee in the morgue if you have a lid on it and you keep it far away from the body. I don't know. You got your dead body in my coffee. (laughs) (laughs) You got your chocolate in my peanut butter. You got your corpse in my coffee. Troy and the doctor are talking and he says he's on the golf committee and then Lord Chetwood bursts in to to find Troy because he's found the silver. Right. And it's big deal. Barnaby is off talking to Sandra. Now, wait a minute. Yeah. Perfect house. Before James comes in to say that he found the silver. Yeah. Tom's talking to Sandra. Yes. And she says that Marjorie didn't like Jenny. Because they are not PLU. People like us. You're not like her. Because Marjorie was disagreeable and argumentative. And regimented, but not but loony. Not loony. <laughs> I looked up PLU because I wondered if that was actual kind of uppity slang, yeah. or whether it was just kind of made up for the show. It is real. People do say that. Oh. But luckily, now the PLU and people like us more dominantly prefers to the leading gay rights movement in Singapore. Nice. They are people. PLU people like us. Go gay rights in Singapore. That's right. Absolutely. Um, so, so maybe Sandra was saying she's not a gay rights activist in Singapore like us. Yes. <laughs> i tell you one thing that Sandra does do is project. Mm. She is just all about all those other people are just so awful. Because she thinks that she's somehow somebody different than who she actually is because she denies all reality. There's $150,000 in stock in the club. Mm -hmm. That'll come back later. That's a good amount of money. Then maybe the most exciting scene in this entire episode happens. Lay it on me. The high-tech lab. Police technician. Why do we never see this lab? They've got a car up on a lift. They've got black Mm. lights. They've got motorcycles. They've got lasers. I'm waiting for Q to come out. Q should be there. 
<laughs> well, we reversed the polarity on this thing and we found this time traveling loop and that's how Sandra killed him. You know, like... <laughs> and also a towel from the feathers. Yes. <laughs> that's what was used as the fire cloth. Now the feathers is interesting. Yes. Because the building that's used for the feathers, yes. which we only see very briefly from the outside, is the very same country house that was used as Melissa, T- Melissa and Archie Townsend's home in Tainted Fruit. Oh, I didn't know that. They do that. They use the same location in multiple episodes, one after each other. One after another, yeah. So now we know that basically Ginny and Selwyn were slipping off to have sex at Melissa's house. Ew. <laughs> 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 Are you gagging just a little bit? Just a little bit. Ew. Speaking of gagging, Lavinia is meeting someone at the Feathers. Oh, he's so reprehensible. Just, it's bad enough that he treats his wife very poorly. It's he, bad enough. It's abusive physically with her later on. That he's a grumple puss. It's bad oh. enough he's having an affair. But turns out he will sleep with anybody who is willing. I'm going to tell you, listen to me, men. I know a lot of men don't want, listen to our show, right? <laughs> I've seen the numbers. <laughs> if you're a man and you're listening, though, listen up. Okay. This is not the way to impress a woman. <laughs> well, it doesn't hurt to ask. I always do. You'd be surprised how often it works. No, we wouldn't. <laughs> I'd be surprised if it ever worked. Yeah. Do you want to go, um, you know? <laughs> no. Ew. Back. Lavinia, to her credit, doesn't gag a little bit when he yeah, says it. She does. She's like <laughs> not into it at all. Back at the scene of the crime, there's a discussion of stuff and yeah. shares and shares and stuff. Because they think they seem to think that there should be like paper shares. So the piece of paper that Barnaby has, this is the second half of the paper obsession, by the way. Well I'm 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 glad we had that little break between the first part of it. The piece of paper that Barnaby has that has the name of the companies on it does in fact have the right name of the companies on it. Okay. Okay. Oh, you're talking about the piece of note paper from his notepad. Now it's only on one side. Because he he has it at Marjorie's and yes. hands it to Troy. Yes. Right? And it's written on one side. Yes. It'll come back later. I know, because when Harry's holding it, it's written on both sides. Yes. I they got they must have got more stocks in the meantime. Speaking of Harry, he's got form. Embezzlement. He, he worked in the city and he embezzled money. And I, this is the point, and this show is really good at this, because at this point, Harry becomes likable. Mm-hmm. He he was on the fence before, but from this point out, Harry's likable. Yeah, initially. We're kind of suspicious of him. He's a little back chatty with Tom and Troy. And so you think, oh, well, you know, he's a hardened criminal. He's got attitude. Yeah. And he's the pool guy, right? So it's the stereotypical pool guy that the bored housewife is going to have an affair with. And he talks to Tamsin. And so you're kind of suspicious of him or whatever. But he is a genuinely likable person who sticks up for people and shares information when he has it. When they ask him for help, he gives them help. He is the hero of the episode. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. And he gives up the letters to Troy. You'd think that he he would have tried to spell something out with him. Well, you know, letters are not his thing. Numbers. That's true. Maybe his dad was a bookie too. (laughs) Poor Tom sitting at the kitchen table with those letters in front of him trying to rearrange them. And Joyce... Who's got lots of free time to play Scrabble, apparently. I'd like to solve the puzzle. <laughs> they, they still need another vowel. It's coming. Yep. Maureen. They need, they, need, they need another E. So they go see Tamsin because the letters are not from the kids next door. Right, because they moved out. Yeah. So did Sandra steal those letters from the kids' toys in the waiting room and dump them in Tamsin's pool one at I, a time? I bet she did. She is loony. I just... I wondered if she did that or if she actually went out and bought a set of plastic letters until she had enough ease to spell Maureen. Either way. Looney. Looney. Yep. She says that Maureen is me. I got pregnant. I put the baby up for adoption. Her husband gives her no money. And she thought that the reading club could be a way she could get her baby back. And then we have two of the most unrealistic scenes in all of Midsummer. Lay it on us. A ginger sunbathing. You no, just don't do we, it. We had the 
The Jenny sunbathing? She's already sunbathed once, and then she does it again. When they come to visit her, she's oh, laying right. out by her pool again. That's right. If you are fair and red-haired, no. you do not voluntarily lay out in the sun. No, you don't. I'm sorry. Even when you're waiting for your 23-minute man. No. She confesses about the bathrobe and about meeting Marjorie at her place that night, but she didn't kill her. And then we have the second unrealistic thing, okay. which is they go to Marjorie's house to look for the shirt that Ginny says she tore. Yeah. And Marjorie, the most fastidious person in all of Midsummer has hung a dirty, torn shirt back up in her wardrobe. Well, don't you do that after a fight? No. It's dirty, and it's torn. You don't put it back on a hanger in the wardrobe. That fight is interesting, because we learn about Gerald in that fight. Oh, Gerald was not the paragon that Marjorie thought he was. No. It's it's come home to roost. And it to, sure does to, hurt her feelings when she's confronted with it. She knows all of that about Gerald. Yeah, it's mean. Yeah, she does. It, well, Ginny's mean. Well, yeah, she is mean. James at the manor is reading Hawk. Because he's wasting away in bed. Oh, I'm going to die. Oh. And Lady Chetwood says that Selwyn wants to buy the house. And he just breaks down. Because he's a weak, lily-livered baby. Well, maybe some eggy bread would help. He's pathetic. Yeah, he is. He's really pathetic. So they interview Jenny Sharp at the, at the Nick. And Ginny Sharp's lawyer has no lines and no credit. No. No. <laughs> the lawyers never do in Midsummer. No. They just sit there quietly. Sometimes they put their hand on somebody's arm to kind of symbolically restrain them and say, think about what you're about to say. Something. But that's about it. Ginny has a gigantic house. Yep. With a beautiful pool. It's beautiful. A convertible. I would love that pool. And the most amazing folly in her backyard. Yep. That brick turret thing it's, it's so awesome yep how does she have so much money i don't know but she doesn't seem to have a job what draws her out of the house to the pool light sound those lights would be on all the time they're part of the pool maybe she hears the splashes of the ashtrays hitting the water there's no foley of that special senses <laughs> Bat senses? Ginny senses. There's a disturbance in my very nice pool. So she goes out to the pool and sees that there are ashtrays from the feathers in the pool. Mm-hmm. First time underwater cam on Midsummer. Yeah, we've had an explosion. Now we have underwater cam. Yep. It's wow. an expensive episode. And it's nighttime underwater cam, so they got to light that place up. I tell you, we learned something about Ginny right here, right now. What did we learn? She can't dodge. Nope. She can't. San Sandra stands there by the pool, makes a joke, and it's just so funny Bunk. that she laughs so hard that she doesn't notice Sandra lifting an ashtray above her head to come down and whack her. Now, we have seen some good dead body acting in this show. But never floating dead body. Never floating dead body at night. It's like almost 30 seconds. Ginny is the star of the dead body acting. Not as good as it could be, though, because in reality, she'd be floating face down. I realize that. Um, and she should be facing down when they find her in the morning. Yeah. And she also should be a little bloated, but I don't think that would be nice. Though when they look at her on the ground after they pull her out, she's very blue. She is very blue. Very blue and pale. They did some makeup there. Yeah, it's okay. Tamison also gets a package from the feathers. Mm-hmm. And we learn that uh George can make a joke. You know, you'd think when they're at the when they're at the feathers and they're talking to the barman about the stolen ashtrays, that at some point somebody would say, Oh, and there's this lady who keeps coming here to buy robes. You would think that. <laughs> it's all done over the phone. They though. don't ask about the robes. No, the, they don't. They go to the bar. They meet they see Selwyn there. And the guy says, well, yeah, these are new ashtrays. The old ones kept getting stolen. And then Barnaby says something about towels and robes, too. That's true. Yep. I guess hotels like, you know, Melissa's house might sell their robes in the gift shop, and the barman wouldn't know anything about it. Maybe. I guess. George asks if this is an anti-smoking murder. <laughs> Which is the worst joke ever. It's a ever. bad joke. Because immediately I thought, does Jenny smoke? <laughs> <laughs> And when they tell Selwyn that Jenny's dead, he doesn't even seem to care. No. So there's no, it's not like this romance that we just don't understand. Yeah. He's just using her like everybody else. And 
He's not good looking to just be like, well, I just sleep with all the hot ladies in the county. Uh, maybe because he's rich and powerful or something. I don't know. Lavinia asks the doc to go see James at home because he's so upset because she told him about Selwyn wanting to buy the house that he can't even get out of bed. She loves him. She knows that James is a hypochondriac, but please, can you help it? Because seeing the doctor does seem to make him feel better. Exactly. Meanwhile, Sandra's listening in. And we got Killer Cam up on the roof. It's a good mannequin they throw off the roof. Lavinia goes off the roof with a bunch of stones first. Then she clearly is not the thing that falls, of right. course. There's, there's an actor that falls a little bit, obviously, onto a big bag. And then there's a mannequin that hits the ground. Yeah. But what Lavinia does do a good job at is she does a good sort of oof. Because <laughs> she's moving yeah. when it cuts to her, the actress. Yeah. It's like that feeling when you're in when you're in bed and you're asleep and you, you dream that you're falling and when you wake up, you feel like you hit the bed. And that's exactly she does what she like does. That. And, and it sells it. Yeah, it, it does. It sells the whole thing. And the rubble. James is just, he's just going to fall apart. Absolutely. You know. Proctor will destroy me. He'll destroy himself. He's got nothing going for him. The issue of the hawk that James is reading is not the same issue as what... Oh, good uh, God, man. <laughs> what Troy is reading. So just a little notice there. What I was impressed by, speaking of the roof, is that the set dressers clearly wanted that house, which is a, actually a very nice estate, Yeah. to look more run down. And so they added some exposed faux brick... Yeah, to the we, outside. we wondered how they did that. It's probably painted on canvas, heavy canvas, that's like adhered to the outside of the stone. Yeah. That would be the easiest way to do it. I guess so. It's convincing. It makes yeah. it look a little bit shoddy. We have to find the shares. <laughs> the shares that are just online. So they take Harry to Marjorie's. And Harry is great because he's like, is that blood over there? Yeah. <laughs> And he sets them straight. He's like, you're looking for the wrong stuff. Yeah. You're not, it's an in nominee account. You're not going to find pieces of paper anywhere. Though he does give up on the computer awfully quickly. I'm impressed with Harry when Tamsin confronts Selwyn about the robe. Yes. Luckily, their pool needs to be cleaned constantly. He's always there. He gets abusive and... Selwyn gets abusive and Harry stands up for Tamsin and protects her. Yeah, he, you can't fire me, I already quit. And then says, thanks for the stock tips, and throws money at Selwyn's face. Who absolutely deserves it. He deserves more than money in his face. Meanwhile, Troy's at the doctor's office, figuring everything out. Yeah. He sees the feathers ashtray, he hears in the headset, he figures out that the wife knows everything. Rupert's a little dumb here. Yeah. He sits with that calm on his desk. With the wires clearly pulled out and taped together underneath it, not even stuffed back inside of it. Yeah. And doesn't notice. Yeah. (laughs) You'd think it would kind of wibble wobble because it's got those wires underneath it all exposed. You wouldn't think. But now we step into crazy land. Let's talk about crazy land. Okay. Okay. I want to know how did Sandra and James meet 10 years ago and did... Rupert and Sandra moved to the village because she met him, or did she meet him after they moved there? I believe she met him after they moved there. He said something completely innocent, and she fell immediately in love with him because she's loony. I'm not so sure of that. Okay. Because when Rupert says they've been sleeping in separate beds for 10 years, I got... I, I have got to go back and watch it again, I guess, to be sure. But I got the impression that they had slept separately since they moved there. Okay. So maybe she met Lord Chetwood before that. Maybe at a garden party or something. Something. With and salads. <laughs> there's lots to think about lots there. Lots to think about there. Somehow or another, she got in her head that he wanted to be with her. Why did she wait 10 years? 10 years. I don't understand that. 10 years. What's the instigating thing? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. This is another case of, it's like the the episode with the guy who's infatuated with his mother. Yeah, what, why does she suddenly become into a, become a homicidal maniac? Yeah, what's the trigger? Yeah. Anyway, she arrives. I can only assume the trigger is that she hasn't been invited to the garden party this year. Well, she says that, 
And she says that triggers her with Marjorie. And then once she gets going. So all this is Rupert's fault. This is all Rupert's fault. He hid the invitation. Yeah. And she started killing. Yeah, it is. And I think he knows that at the end, but doesn't care. He's such a nice man. And he causes his wife to become homicidal. She lets down her hair. And takes her stop sign glasses off. James. So, of course, now she's beautiful. No. No. James, are your dogs on the bed? James immediately figures her out and is like, I'm out of here. He's so pathetic, though. He's hanging out in his boyhood bedroom. I noticed that. With his toys and his comics. Yep. It's just, ugh. It's a little Lloyd. It's a little bit Lloyd there. It's sad. Yep. We get a weird Dutch angle because clearly Sandra's crazy. You have to, Dutch angles when the camera's cocked at an angle so things aren't square anymore, right? Yep. It's all askew. And his beautiful dogs give him away. (laughs) Dogs are like, oh, he's over here. Yeah, he's under this sheet. He's right here. (laughs) The cops arrive, and she's like, are you here to see Lord Chetwood? She just lost it. Just lost it. So we see Rupert with the invite, and he tears it up. And we realize how sad his life has been for the last 10 years. 10 years wasted. That's what you get when you marry a bookie's daughter. That's exactly. (laughs) He should have known what he was getting into. Sandra, what are you doing here? <laughs> so Harry... And I did all the donkey work. Harry and Tamsin get to take off together in his trailer. Well, hold on. We have the interrogation where she goes through everything. Well, yeah, because she's loony, so she's going to give it up. And they do an interesting thing where when Lavinia dies, they drop the camera from the height. Yep. And... You know, some cameraman held his breath the entire time they did that. Hoping that that thing wasn't going to get smashed. Yeah. Harry's moving on with Tamsin, or Mm -hmm. Maureen, as she's known now. Sorry to hear about your pension. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to get our boy back. Harry is the hero of the episode. He's a good guy. Yep. And Troy's going to get to sell his Hawk collection to a comic collector for a whole bunch of money. Go on, have a guess. Too bad. uh... Barnaby's got no pension. Yeah. (laughs) Because it's off in Belize. So we've got three corpses. Marjorie, yep. Jenner, Jenny, and Lavinia. Yep. And you think Jenny's the best? I, I, I'm voting Jenny. I'm going with you on that one. Let's talk about after the credits. Okay. Poor S- Rupert. Sandra's going to go to jail. Yep. Done. Dr. Bradshaw's all alone. Yes. Poor Rupert. James Chetwood is all alone. James is all alone. But they have something to keep them happy. As far as I can tell, the following people receive money... From the Reading Club. Okay. Tamsin gets $50,000. Yes. James gets $50,000. Yes. And Rupert gets $50,000. Pounds. All pounds. True. Did Marjorie and Gerald have kids? I didn't get the sense that they did. I didn't get the sense they did. So the $150,000 gets divided between three of them. So who gets Jenny's house and who gets Marjorie's house? I don't know, but some lucky person. Some third cousin once removed. Probably. Is going to get all of Jenny's awesome stuff, her pool or convertible or awesome house. Yep. Sandra's in jail. Harry and Tamsin are off. And guess what? Vera has done all this work, and I doubt there's going to be a var- garden party now. <laughs> Poor Vera. She <sighs> found the body. She doesn't have any place to take her salads. No. Nope. <laughs> Lots to think about there. <laughs> That's my line from the episode. <laughs> because it just makes me think, what is there to think about salads? There's like, lots to think about there. Mm, jello salads or tossed salads or individual. Fruit salad? Fruit, oh, fruit salads. I hadn't even thought about fruit salads. You could list the kinds of salad that you might think at the garden party on our social media. Antipasto salad? Yes, mm-hmm. which includes at Midsummer Maniacs on Instagram or Twitter. Caprizi salads? Excellent. Mm-hmm. We're also on the Facebook group for Midsummer Murders and the Facebook group for Acorn TV. Chef salads. Excellent. Bread salads. Uh, also, our email is midsummermaniacs at gmail.com. Now, this there's also that quinoa kind of salad, yeah, that kale weird quinoa stuff. Kind yeah. of stuff. Now, uh, we're, this is going to be releasing on the 1st of December, which is the new episodes of Midsummer will also be dropping. So you may find something else in your feed, a little uh, special 
treat from us about the new Midsummers as well. I'm still thinking about fruit salads. I, I know you're still thinking about mm. fruit salads, but it's time to say bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. Son of the guy who gets killed at the end. Yes. Well, he gets killed too. Yeah, he's he is the girlfriend who's the child. Right. No, he doesn't get killed. We went over this. Oh, that's right. He doesn't, he doesn't get Jeez. killed. I'm telling you, you. For some reason, you want to kill little Stevie Cavendish. Because I have this idea that his wife is alone at the end. No, she's not. <laughs>